So I want to start today with a land acknowledgement. Um, you know, my place of residence is Olympia, Washington, and I live on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Nisqually, the Coast Salish, the Cowlitz, and the Chehalis nations. And just acknowledge the painful history and the forced removal from this territory. And we pay our respect to the diverse indigenous peoples that are still connected to this land. And um, for those of you that are interested, um, you know, we can either put in the chat or it's available on the slide. There is this resource um, that's available in terms of um, identifying um, the native, uh, you know, the tribes that lived where you live, so you can acknowledge. So just before we dive in, um, you know, the Population Health Innovation Lab, my name is Sue Grinnell and I'm the director of the Innovation Lab. And um, innovation labs are strategies to solve complex problems. And our focus is on health-focused multi-sector collaboratives and or accountable communities for health. And listed on this slide are a number of the types of services that we offer. And we are constantly seeking out new trends, tools, anything that we feel like that can contribute to the success of multi-sector collaboratives. And today, you know, we are going to learn about a tool that might be help helpful to you. What I'm drawn to in particular about Lumio, and I've known about this and used it a bit um, over the years, is one of the really important pieces in the work that we do, right, with bringing community together is trust building. And trust takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of intentionality and it requires transparency, right? Like that's one of the, the contributors to trust. So today, I think this tool, you'll see how it can actually contribute to transparent decision-making. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Elwood Smith. Michael is actually in Wellington, New Zealand, which is, which is quite fun. And he is a, a founding member of Lumio. He's a founding member of the, and on the board and a cooperative um, member. He leads customer development for Lumio, which means um, helping people implement Lumio to address their needs and improve collaboration within their organization. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Michael. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction, Sue. So kia ora, hairi mai, um, hello and welcome. My name's Michael, I live in Wellington, New Zealand, which is also known as Poniki, Aotearoa by our indigenous Maori people. Uh, Tifananga Nui Aitara, or Wellington Harbour is a great place for swimming. Uh, which is where uh, we live. Uh, we have good access to the bush trails and the mountains of Tangi Tikau, which is Mount Victoria and the Tararua. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today and I look forward to introducing you to, uh, to something of Lumio. And I think without any um, further ado, I'll just jump straight in and start sharing um, my screen with you. And you are hopefully now all seeing a slide deck that says 21st century decision-making in a multi-sector collaborative. Uh, so a couple of things just to, uh, to kick off uh, what I'd like to, to take you through today. Um, uh, we're now into the intro uh, to Lumio. So I'll give you a short tour of what um, Lumio is about. Uh, we'll then look at some of the questions that um, some of you have very kindly responded to in the Lumio group. So we thought that was a great opportunity for you to uh, be able to participate and kind of warm up a little bit in terms of the, the kinds of questions and the discussion area that we'll be looking at today. Uh, I think from there, we will just look at collaborative decision making. What actually is this? How do we build trust? How do we build shared understanding? Um, how do we work together? And what are some of the different types of tools and, uh, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of some of those? Um, it'll be great to get your input uh, as and we're in that section. And then we'll run through a few examples. Uh, we'll see how much time we have for that. Um, I've got lots of them, but uh, we'll start off with, with two key ones of, of how that may work. Um, open to questions. It's not a huge group, uh, I don't think. 
So uh, if you see questions coming in, I'll pause at certain times and, and we can explore those questions as we go. Um, so firstly, uh, Lumio. It's a collaboration digital workspace uh, for your organization. Uh, it's a software tool, it's an online tool, uh, and it's really focused and our intent is to bring together all of your important communication, your discussions, decisions into one place. Uh, it is about increasing transparency and inclusion, and it can help you decrease the number of meetings and the number of emails uh, that you may deal with in your inbox. Uh, it also protects and archives that knowledge over time. Now you may ask, well, who, who are we and what gives us any right to build a, a tool that tries to do all these things? Well, we're organized as a worker-owned cooperative um, based here from Aotearoa in New Zealand. Uh, but we have members all over the world and we're part of a wider network called Inspiral. Uh, so some of our um, members are in California. Uh, we have um, uh, connections in the US, uh, but also in Europe. Uh, and we have uh, some of our original um, uh, supporters and financial supporters. Uh, we're from Korea and uh, other uh, parts of the world. So quite a global organization. Lumia has been running now for since uh, 2013, uh, started off as an open source project, and we've been working over this time to build it into a sustainable business uh, going forwards and a service that can continue to support uh, our customers who are um, uh, many thousands that are uh, uh, using uh, Lumia throughout the world. As um, we also have a, a social purpose, uh, which is, uh, are being a key driver behind Lumio, and that's enabling people to be involved in decisions that affect them. Um, and with all of this, it's probably not surprising to know that our software is open source, um, and we've built it really from a people-first perspective. So this is not about imposing decision, particular decision-making processes on people. It's more about trying to figure out and understand and learn from how people are trying to make decisions in their organizations and allowing them to configure, adapt, and make those more inclusive, uh, transparent, and collaborative. We acknowledge um, Māori in New Zealand as the tangata whenua, or the first people, um, and Treaty of Waitangi Partners of Aotearoa New Zealand. So a couple of key concepts. Uh, hopefully this is fairly straightforward. Lumio is about bringing people together um, in a group where you can have a discussion about a topic. Uh, and we call that, we do that in threads, uh, what we call threads, uh, to propose a solution where we use proposals to create an outcome. Uh, so you have a decision uh, that comes at the end of this. So these are the three the three main concepts. And of course, as you know, with any kind of collaborative decision, it's never quite as straightforward as a linear process from one place to another. So you will see in here, there's a lot of opportunity to iterate and develop and learn and progress uh, discussions through to decisions. But creating a clear outcome and a clear, a clear decision is one of the things that's the uh, I, I would say is critical to, to the success of any decision-making process, um, but also is really important to, to Lumio and probably where Lumio stands out from almost all other tools in that regard. Uh, so let's look at groups to start with. So groups are a place where uh, you gather. Uh, it's the place that most people come to when they arrive. There's typically a description uh, of what's happening in the group and some information about what's going, what kind of work is going to happen there. So we encourage people to have a purpose and a clear uh, description about um, how you can participate that um, will welcome people. There may also be a, uh, a frame around a code of conduct or a link to a constitution or to some other terms of reference um, for that particular group. Um, but a good way to think of this is that it's like, um, a group is a bit like bringing people into a meeting space. So how do you want to prepare that meeting space for people as they arrive um, and the kind of agenda that, uh, that, you will, that you will have for them and for the work that you're going to do? Threads are about dis uh, discussing topics. So these are an opportunity to share information, um, to raise a question, uh, prepare for a meeting, 
uh, maybe uh, a workflow process like uh, approving a grant um, or making an important decision. Threads are about keeping all of the information and discussion about a topic in one place. And there are many ways that you can use threads. Uh, you can uh, copy them, move them. Uh, you can even create um, branches from the threads into other threads as conversations develop and go off into other topic areas. Uh, but for now, uh, a thread is, is like having everything in one place uh, where you can have that discussion without lots and lots of emails. The proposal is where things really start happening in Lumio. This is how what the tool that you can use to progress your discussion towards a decision. So an opportunity to, for people to have their say uh, with a voting. And uh, as you'll see, uh, we get into this, there is an opportunity to do um, thumbs up or abstain or disagree uh, sort of voting symbols, but there are many other voting types as well. A key thing of proposals is that a time is set so that everyone knows when the proposal is closing. You can always extend that if you need to, but that timing uh, allows focus so that people know that uh, now some action is taking place and now is the time to participate. So it's good to be able to focus um, uh, people towards uh, the work that you're actually asking of them. And Lumio will also send out a reminder to people uh, 24 hours before the voting closes or the proposal closes. There are many ways to use proposals and I won't go into each of these just yet, but um, they can be about building consensus. They can be about um, developing and focusing on specific decision-making processes. Um, but they're also a great way of drawing out quiet voices. Uh, and, uh, and one of our favorite ways of using it internally is what we call the temperature check. You know, how do people feel about progressing towards this? We don't yet have all the information to make a clear decision, uh, but how are people feeling about this um, uh, process? And that brings us to the outcome um, when you can make a decision. So when the proposal closes, uh, the results are clear. Uh, in fact, the results actually are available during the proposal process. Uh, and at the end, you have um, uh, developed uh, some understanding. Sometimes proposals fail and that's fine because people bring in new information and it's, uh, it can be good to actually recognize that and then adjust the proposal, maybe even stop the proposal and start a new one. Um, but uh, you know, what has changed? Uh, what really has changed is that you found some new information um, through that process. So uh, with more information and with more input, you can, you can have a better outcome, a better decision ultimately. A couple of other little things um, just before we move on. So as well as a group, there are subgroups. So you can have a, a main parent group, if you like, we call for the organization. Uh, but you can have subgroups for different uh, areas of work, um, a working team, a board, a committee, uh, as an example. And, not, and as well as the proposal, we actually have this whole suite of polls. <laughs> Uh, almost too many sometimes they think, but um, these, these polls are very useful for progressing discussions for uh, sometimes used for an election, uh, but they're also very good for prioritizing uh, uh, strategic objectives, for example, or, or getting um, a, a test in the, uh, of how people are actually um, voting uh, or, or thinking about a particular subject. So um, some of them that you may or may not be useful, uh, use, use, sorry, used to, uh, such as um, the dot vote um, process, which is where you allocate a, a budget of, of dots uh, to people, which is really useful to get people to think not only about the priority of something, but also the budget or the resource constraints. Um, if we have 10 strategic objectives for the year ahead, we can probably realistically only deal with three of them. So what are the three that we're really going to focus on? So let's just shift gear for a second uh, and, um, and jump into the, uh, to the Lumio group. I'm really interested um, uh, to, to just go through some of your responses uh, in here and perhaps just um, 
uh, before we pause, uh, actually, before we jump into that, I'll just pause for a second just to see if anybody has any questions. Um, in fact, I'm just going to stop screen sharing just to raise it back for everybody. But any questions that are uh, popping up for people? Michael, I'm wondering, could you go back to the one slide? Um, so all of those are options of how you can get input and come to decisions? Yes. Um, do you mean the, uh, uh, the slide, uh, the poll slide? Was, yeah, I think was that. Yes. This one, yeah. OK, so. So yes. depending upon, yeah, go ahead, sorry. So we have, um, let me walk them through uh, just briefly. So the time poll is, uh, you may have used um, doodle polls or something like that before to try ah, to find the time okay. to meeting. Yeah. Uh -huh. So time poll is integrated within Lumio. And uh, one of the cool things about time poll, uh, it helps you to, to select a, a couple of different uh, time options. But it, um, it also will identify the different time zones that, um, that people are in. And, uh, and so when you are sending this out, if I sent this to you, for example, you would uh, receive uh, the options in your time zone. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the, um, uh, when the time poll closes, uh, then you can attach a calendar invitation um, uh, event as well. Um, to that. So that's all about, yeah, when when can we find a time to meet? Just, you know, cutting down on that backwards and forwards. Um, sure. Yeah, before this, it can, it can take a lot of time. Uh, the um, the check poll uh, down here, this is a, a very simple poll that uh, it really is asking people, have they done a thing or or not? So it's, it's kind of like a nudge. Mm -hmm. um, there's mm -hmm. lots of different ways that you can use this. Uh, for example, um, uh, you know, if you're looking for volunteers, uh, I'm looking for people to join this particular committee. Um, you know, would you, it's, and it's really just a yes or a no. So, uh, so people can say, you know, yes, they, but they, it's one of those polls that, that people can actually be engaged with. Uh, another one is um, I'm coming to an event. So an RSVP uh, is a useful thing, or I have done a thing. For example, I've completed my actions, um, you know, that I had from the last meeting or I have read the minutes of the previous meeting and I'm ready for our next meeting. Um, a poll is uh, just a simple poll. This is just giving uh, different options. So the simple poll, probably not much um, worth saying much more about that. But these, these polls are of course, are just getting ideas. Um, I, uh, we quite often use them for, uh, for just, um, uh, getting people to uh, to respond and engage, and and I think you know that's really what a lot of these polls are actually for. They're not only providing valuable information for you; they're actually engagement tools to progress. A score poll is um, is ranking something according to preference. So this is your opportunity to say, "Hey, we'd really like to do uh, uh, you know certain certain things." Um, this particular example is about uh, an, an unconference, you know, what are the topics uh, and inviting people to to um, to rank uh, their preference for this. So they could put a high ranking on or a low ranking and so forth. And so then the group is uh, you're getting the outcome of this you know, from the group. Uh, dot vote I've I've mentioned um, um, briefly. It is about uh, getting a a poll that um, is constrained by a budget of resources uh, and helps people to think about that. And then rank choice is, um, is like an election. It's you know, first past the post sort of thing. You know, how, how do you rank these in order uh, and what are the rankings that come up? Okay, um, any other questions? Thanks, Thanks. that's helpful. Cool. So. Um, I'm just going to uh, put, jump for a second and go into our Lumio group um, that we set here. So we're in Lumio um, 
now. Uh, you can see this is the Lumia.org and the Public Health Institute Lumia webinar we set up. Um, and you'll notice uh, just very briefly that um, there's a sidebar menu. You may, those of you that have already been in here, which include uh, a list of the different groups that I'm a member of uh, and some information from a dashboard and so forth where I can see and get access to uh, what are the most recent threads and the active polls. Um, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time taking you through Lumio. So I think let's just dive a little bit into, into the, uh, the questions that we posed. So um, we were interested in, in preparation for this and just exploring uh, what decision making is in a multi-sector collaborative. So we asked some questions. Um, and the first one was really around well, what are your current decision making practices? Uh, we know that um, particularly the COVID pandemic has restricted our ability to meet in person and has invited um, or required us to do uh, and be more innovative in how we can connect together. So um, just interested if anybody wants to, there's some great um, answers here. I hope you don't mind me sharing them, uh, but they are transparent in the Lumia group in any case, but only amongst our people. Uh, but is that, would anybody like to speak further about any of their, any of these points? See, there's a chat. Great, no. So I thought these were good. Um, we're really, really interesting answers uh, to the questions, you know, to what are your decision-making practices? Um, so there's quite a variety here and, and I think um, uh, answers here are not not unusual. Interesting from from Christine, you know, the range of different tools that are being used here, um, and mm -hmm. you know, I guess I guess the the question I would ask there is really about the clarity of decisions um, through through those tools. How do you know has it if a decision has actually been made? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, look. Great, great question. So we won't dive too much into each of these areas, but, um, but I thought that this was a, a, a very good warm up. When we're looking at the kinds of decision, collaborative decisions um, that people are making, um, let's dive into that one. So the question was, um, we make lots of decisions every day. Uh, however, some decisions require the input, advice or consent of others. Uh, tell us about some of the collaborative decisions that you make. Um, so when Sue and I were putting this work together, we were thinking of things like fundraising and priorities and policy approvals and so forth. Um, so Sue's mentioned here that, uh, uh, that some of the decisions are about resource allocations or proceeding for a grant, types of social, me social media messaging to use. Um, you know, Andrew's mentioned here that the mission is driven by the core belief that the most effective way to bring awareness to the challenges and barriers, um, as well as to address the complexities is through collaboration. Uh, so a de facto community table, which government, community, industry and consumer organizations sit um, for the very purpose. So that's, that's interesting. And I'm interested to know how that happens. I guess that's in person or, or, um, or with Zoom. Um, different types of uh, range of decisions, you know, from, and this is typical, there are, uh, I guess, small decisions or work related decisions that, um, that take place. And then there are larger, bigger ones, which impact a lot of other people. So it's one of the things to think about when you're, um, when you're looking at a collaborative decision, is this something that uh, is only affecting me or is it affecting other people? Um, and to what extent uh, should those other people be involved in the decision-making mm. process. Mm. Um, building templates. It makes me wonder, like when you're saying that, if I'm tracking, <laughs> it's like, um, who decides how this gets set up? Mm -hmm. Right, like, you know, so I think, you know, just in terms of it, is it, is it, Bruce or Andrew, right, or just the act of what are the right questions to be asking? Um, is it, you know, which, 
may or may not be on Lumio, but it's like getting to this place where you're asking the question. That's right. This is um, this is the kind of question that uh, a lot of the, all collaborative organizations ultimately have to deal with, which is mm -hmm. how do we make decisions as a group? Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes this is embedded in the in the way that the the collaborative or the organization is operating so it's being written down somewhere or perhaps it's implicit uh which is it's just the way we've always done things mm. um, so the questions really i'm looking to explore here are to open up the thinking uh, i'm not trying to come with answers so much but open up the thinking about how decisions are made mm -hmm. um, in the organization and how well are they operating um, there and and uh, so there's a lot of work that can be done around the decision making process and how the organization actually operates mm -hmm. this is just to warm you up so don't get freaked out about all of this uh, <laughs> too much so, uh, and i'm not going to go into too much detail it was really just a warm-up before we sort of dive into a few things so and the next sort of question, you know, how are they actually working out for you? So this is really the question here mm -hmm. uh, that I'm exploring as well. Okay, you know, we know that we need to be making collaborative decisions and that some, you know, need to be involving more people than others. Um, how are they actually working? You know, does, does that work for us? Is it timely? Do we feel that we're, do we feel that we're actually meeting the, the values and the culture of the organization? Um, that is expected or that we expect or the organization expects mm -hmm. um, so yeah andrew's got a great point here about you know challenge of getting diverse groups of people together reaching shared understanding um, uh, and allowing space for discordance to take time and i guess that's what I, i'm touching a little bit on with with that proposal uh, to that opportunity to um, to open up and allow people and, and give them a safe space to feel comfortable to uh, to say when they disagree with something uh, or or they're unhappy um, uh, in some way and um, and quite often this can be in real time can be pushed uh, under the table pushed fast pushed through uh, you know because of time so you know real real issues here uh, that we we all deal with um, and Bruce has also got one here involving people in a timely manner um, mm. yeah, thank you thank you for those points these are very very helpful and then the last um, question uh, that we were exploring for now at least is um, about asynchronous decisions so asynchronous um, may be a new term for you but in many ways it is uh, something I'm going to talk about in a second but it's um is the kind of decisions you need to make where you're not all together at the same time um, at the same place and which of course has become more of an issue uh, with um, our inability to meet in person so uh, so typical ways you know of, of doing this are you know through zoom calls just like um, we're doing right now uh, but Andrew's you know got a good point here too that the facilitating um, facilitation of decision making uh, you know, can benefit, but the decision making itself um, is done through surveys. I'm interested to explore a little bit more what Andrew's saying here, but uh, I think um, the fact that uh, that you can do polling, but you're still uncovering information, and then you need to bring that new information back to the group to to develop it mm -hmm. and and modify the proposal. Uh, or the decision that's actually being made in some way. Um, mm -hmm. you know, these are very real issues. So I hope, um, unless there are any comments, does anybody want to make any comments about any of the questions or answers that we have said, or my misinterpretation of them, if I have done so? Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is Andrew. I, I did put some responses in there, but I had to take a phone call for most of this. I, I couldn't not take it. So I'm sorry, I missed a lot of the kind of discussion. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your contributions. I really appreciated the thought you put into the um, into those answers. And okay. and I think it's, help, it's helpful for other people too. And that's really why I was um, interested to do this little exercise because it, 
it's uh, <laughs> you you will only believe what I say to a certain level. Uh, just be honest, right? So, uh, but you will believe what each other says or what you say yourself. So, uh, if if I can get you to begin to think about the problems that you may be facing when you're thinking, how do we make collaborative decisions together? Um, then it's helping to raise awareness and uh, you know of of mm -hmm. that of those issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to pretend that I have like magic bullets or anything for this. This is this is uh, you know just to be clear, <laughs> this this isn't easy work. This is human work of, of people talking with people, engaging with other people. Uh, uh, what we are trying to do at Lumio is to help facilitate that process to make it a little easier, a little bit more transparent and inclusive. Uh, for and, you. Uh, and I, I, I just have a question. In the US, are you doing many, I know like you're in New Zealand, but do you do a lot of collaborative kind of interventions using this platform in the US? We um, primarily, we're, uh, we support our tool. We're not, we don't run so okay. much as a consultant okay. organization mm -hmm. uh, you know, in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but we, through conversations like this and work, mm -hmm. working with many different organizations in the US and across the world, uh, we have the opportunity to learn from what they're discovering as well. So, okay. um, so yeah, so that's, that's a short answer, but I'm happy to talk about that further. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I'll push on and um, uh, just go back to our slides. And I uh, just wanted to break down uh, a little bit about collaborative decision making um, from that thought process that we've just we've just been through. So here's here's uh, some common decision making practices that that we usually see. Uh, one person makes the decision, um, often known as autonomy or autonomous decision. Um, a small group makes a decision on behalf of others. So this could be a committee or a board or some other uh, governance group that has a delegated authority to, to do that. Um, we all make decisions, which is a consensus or majority rules. Um, but there are also others uh, that are commonly practiced, uh, like seeking advice from others. Even a manager, uh, a good management decision is often um, much better if they actually seek advice from experts. Uh, and, and then the last one there is around consent. Um, in some cases, you need, I want to make a decision, but if I, for example, want to buy a new piece of software, uh, I may, I need to get the consent of my IT manager um, before I can do that. So um, there are others, but the, those are, are the, the most common ones, perhaps, that we, that we see. And, uh, and when it comes to asynchronous um, decisions, uh, this is really when a, a time when we can't always get the same people at the same time to participate. Um, so the kinds of decisions we've been talking about there, um, particularly ones like um, uh, de even delegation, consensus, advice and consent, they, they aren't always easily done in person. Uh, they can be if you've got good systems and practices and you've got high trust and engagement of the people who are involved and they're available. Um, but when people aren't available, uh, then, uh, uh, or there's time pressure and so forth, then an asynchronous decision uh, can be made. So when you think of asynchronous, think of um, uh, things like uh, email or uh, that I'm, I'm writing a, um, a letter and I have to send a document to somebody for a signature you know, before the final decision is made. That's asynchronous. Um, so the advantages of this is that uh, you are alleviating time pressure in meetings. Um, people get the opportunity for more thought, consideration, because uh, they've got time to think and read um, and dwell a little bit on that, deliberate on it. Uh, you do get a clear record uh, and the process has to be a bit more visible um, for asynchronous. You're, you're almost forced to say, this is the decision we're making and I need your involvement in it. So it does help make the decision-making process more visible and transparent. Um, so you know, finding simple ones are things like finding the time to meet, um, we've shown maybe approving the document, hiring a new staff member, um, for example. 
Uh, this is a fairly dense slide and it's one of, um, so sorry, sorry for that, but I, I thought on one page, how can I contrast um, the values of, of inclusion, transparency and trust uh, of, of how this operates, I guess, in the Lumio world and where we commonly see problems uh, with email chat and video. So just sort of walking through this, um, in Lumio, uh, there's the opportunity through the, the group and the thread to include people in the discussion uh, and the important decisions, whether they're a member of the group or they're invited uh, to a particular thread. So questions, topics, issues, uh, members of the group can participate uh, at a time and a place and to a level of detail that works best for them. So quite often we'll see uh, that there's, particularly in a larger group, there's a small core group of people who are working away on, a, let's say a document or a policy. Uh, but there are um, a much wider group who are, who are watching and um, they're quite happy for the small group to continue doing their work, uh, but they're able to remain in, in context and see what's actually happening, um, follow the progress. Uh, so there's a level of transparency that can happen. Um, but there comes a time when maybe you want to take that policy to an approval stage. And at that point, you do need to engage people. So it's a lot easier generally if people have already been along or been watching the journey um, for to be able to turn them and get them to vote then on, on passing a policy uh, if they have been in context um, through that time. So um, this all helps to, to build um, trust and, and clarity really around um, decision-making uh, and giving a history of decisions and a discussion so you can see what has happened at the past. Um, being confident in the privacy and the integrity of, um, of your group membership. You know, these, this all builds, builds trust um, through that shared understanding. Uh, in email, we all know emails get lost. Um, people get left out. Uh, you know, how many, I once um, was speaking to somebody and they talked to me about the, uh, like local council actually, about the reply all email um, she called it the email chain of doom, that, that uh, time when you are uh, sending a broadcast email out to people and then some people reply back just to you and other people reply to somebody else and then they add other people to the, to the reply or and in the end you've got this you know, unfathomable um, um, email and your inbox is cluttered. Um, we like chat tools, uh, chat is, really has a purpose. Um, great at quick conversations when you need to connect to someone, but quite often what we find is that they're not so good for um, progressing that conversation towards an outcome. Um, people tend to miss out on conversations uh, if they're not present at the time. And, um, and if you're trying to find where a chain, uh, you know, back in that thread of that conversation where you can engage um, and the conversation's already moved on, it can be quite difficult if you're trying to re-engage. Um, history is often lost uh, and it's kind of hard to search as well. Um, and video tools, as we're using now, are perfect for real-time meeting and uh, making discussions and decision-making. Um, but even, you know, on this call, not everybody could make it uh, that had registered. So um, hard to get everybody together to come. And if we were making a decision, sometimes we get a little rushed um, for that. So. With all of that in mind, you know, we recognize that actually there's, a, there's value in kind of thinking about the tools that you have um, and how you map those to your work processes and to the culture and the way that you operate as an organization. So, um, you know, use chat, uh, you know, Slack, um, MS Teams, other sorts of chats, uh, and, and use that for that quick participation, quick feedback. Um, but recognize it's not the tool for, for making decisions uh, or even for serious conversations sometimes that involve more people. Asynchronous um, with, uh, for example, where Lumio fits, it is about participating in your own time. It's more structured, um, a thread per topic, and, uh, and it's accessible across time. So we can go back to the earliest days of, of uh, Lumio to see the discussion that led to us deciding to become a worker-owned cooperative. Um, who was involved? What uh, uh, concerns were raised? 
uh, what um, uh, what discussion took place and and you know what was the outcome um, um, of that. Uh, but there is another thing about asynchronous that it's worth noting, um, particularly for you, is that there is an aspect of hosting that's required. Part of the reason that chat is so successful is that you don't have to think about it. <laughs> you just just get in there and start chatting. And, uh, and so it just becomes almost a stream of conscious uh, chat quite often. Um, but when you're into an asynchronous, uh, even just writing an email, you have to pause for a minute and think a little bit about, well, what's my subject line? What's, uh, who, who do I need to address this to? What actually is the content that I'm writing? So a little bit more thought goes into writing an email. It's similar with the Lumio thread. You are thinking about, okay, what is the topic? How am I going to introduce this? How will people respond? How can I help them engage? That's what we mean by this hosting. Um, and then there's always static documentation, uh, you know, a wiki or Google Docs or, or a document management system. Um, really important for storage uh, and for keeping, um, uh, but always out of date. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the documents are, uh, are being changed and um, uh, the time as well. So, you know, pros and cons of, of all of those. So, just going to pause again for um, before we go forwards, before I dive into some examples. So we have about um, 15 minutes uh, left. Um, any questions on anything that we've talked about so far? Um, I have a quick question on the sort of requires hosting aspect of it. So is that just kind of it requires sort of more thoughtful, intentional kind of framing? or hosting in the sense that you kind of have to keep your eye on the thread and be like hosting, moving it along and hosting the conversation, or is it a little bit of both, do you think? Yeah, a little bit of both, actually. Um, it's, if you, let's say if you own uh, a decision-making um, process, you, you, um, you're the leader for bringing a policy in place and, and it's part of your work to help um, achieve the outcome is an agreed policy, uh, then you're kind of incentivized to want to actually follow that conversation, to set it up right, um, and to develop it. So I guess that's the level of, of hosting I'm thinking of here. Mm -hmm. There are other, there are threads uh, that we quite often use. We, we use a, a thread um, as a bit like a bulletin board or a wall on a particular subject. Um, and I can show you some examples of that, but they, they are, um, uh, the kind, those sorts of threads don't need hosting or support. Mm -hmm. They just there, but people know, you know, there's, if there's information. We run, we want run a thread, for example, on um, on on our competitors. You know, what are what are other software tools doing? And when we mm -hmm. get information, we post it into that thread, so mm -hmm. easily found and searchable. Yeah. Uh, but for something like a workflow process to build a a policy document is something that um, a little bit of attention to to the setup and actual the facilitation through that. And noticing who's not been involved, who's not engaged so far. Uh, and uh, we've got a number of tools like seen by and, and um, other things to nudge people <laughs> to help, help you, uh, tools for you to help nudge others to participate. Okay, great, thank yeah, you. Thanks. Any other questions? I, um, go ahead, sir. No, please. No, go on. No, please, Andrew. Uh, I, you know, I was just wondering, like, since so this is collaborative decision making, is there typically an overarching question that people, you know, I'm just trying to think, like, in a say strategic planning perspective, you have a kind of overriding question that everybody's trying to make a decision towards in terms of go, no go, or whatever. Um, are there different levels of filtration in the system in terms of what could be strong? Like if people are sharing, you know, evidence or they're sharing, you know, what they know, you know, that would be help make that decision. Is there ways to filter that in terms of what's strong, what's weak, what's medium in terms of, you know, kind of being certain about the decision that you're making? Does that make sense? And I'm thinking like even in the intelligence community, does Saddam Hussein have nuclear weapons? You know, well, the intelligence community was collecting a lot of disparate information and talking and chatting amongst themselves. 
but building that evidence up, for example, you know, to yes, he does, no, he doesn't. But, you know, there's kind of strengths in that kind of information. And in your system, do you have the same kind of mechanisms where you can look at what's strong and compelling versus what's sneak, weak, or might need more kind of understanding or research or that? Yeah, uh, yeah, great question. That's, uh, that's something that is revealed, can be revealed through use of uh, proposal and, and the polls. Mm. So um, uh, I'm just thinking of a, I think I've got an example a little bit later um, in our slides, so I may be able to show you that. But uh, for example, if I'll try to explain it briefly. Um, if you run a poll where you were assessing uh, uh, the priorities or the, 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 the different strengths, if you like, um, of, of information that you were looking at, and you get people to, um, to apply this, um, we, um, the poll results can provide uh, not just a ranking, if you like, of what, what was most popular, but it also shows um, a number of, uh, of, of points of, of how people have voted. So there's one that we were looking at the other day where, um, where we had uh, the majority of people uh, had voted towards a certain way, but there was a, a strong, what we'd call a, a vocal minority that had a very, very clear uh, picture. So they, they ranked, ranked certain, a couple of things very, very high. And so the question there is, if you just looked at the majority um, rule, you would probably make a decision based on that. But then uh, the question really for you, for you, I suppose, as a group is to look at what is that vocal minority? Is this something we should pay attention to? Uh, if they got some information or they know something that the rest of the group doesn't know, should we um, you know, bring this in? It's, a, it's an indication, if you like, of wanting to go deeper. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, yeah, let's. I'll jump into some of the um, into some of these um, examples just to quickly run through. Uh, just conscious of time, so there's a few um, that uh, that I've put together here. But these these are some typical examples of of Lumio. So one is around engaging your network and community, um, sharing information, connecting with peers, developing best practices. You know, common common things that we see use of Lumio. Um, and facilitating participation. Um, second area is, is really around governance. Uh, and you know, when you see the description of good governance, it is often referred to as participatory, consensus-oriented, uh, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive. And of course, follows the rule of law. So all of these things are, are, are important and um, uh, in, in uh, we often say within in Lumio that um, uh, governance is more than just a board meeting. Uh, it's actually the work that takes place between meetings, the discussions, the topics, and remaining in context. Um, and then the third area is uh, around working teams. Um, I've already mentioned uh, examples like policy development, prioritizing objectives, uh, building a culture of, of work together uh, for inclusion and transparency. So let me take you into um, uh, an example of, uh, this is actually a, lot, a real example of um, engaging your network. Uh, so there's a, there's a group in, in New Zealand called Equally Well, which are uh, a collective that came together to address the problems that people experiencing mental health issues had with their physical health. And uh, this started actually as a, um, as a conference uh, back in 2014, and as a network that it has grown to some hundreds of um, people now, uh, bringing together people across the, uh, uh, the, the professional community and including people for, with lived experience. So um, this is a, an introduction, if you like, to, to one of the threads, um, bringing people together. You know, they're talking to, to champions and so forth, and they wanted to create a community of practice. So it's just an example, um, and it's raw. I mean, this is, I haven't edited this at all. So this is just how, how uh, Helen wrote it, um, of bringing people together. And uh, I know this is pretty dense. So if you're looking on your phone, this may be a bit difficult, but um, 
you can see here that she's, Helen's raised a, um, a thread um, on a particular subject of just raising awareness, uh, which has been you know, seen by 171 people and 342 were notified um, of this. So I'm not going to, you don't have to read the details of all of this. It's more just introducing the subject. And then we've got a number of emoticons here that, that people are, are liking that, um, showing support. You know, for Helen and for the work, and then uh, jumping into the conversation. And this is the kind of conversation you know you see starting to, to take place. Um, and then uh, Helen raised a, a proposal, um, a poll actually. Uh, it's a simple poll to explore uh, what were some of the um, focus areas uh, for the work you know, of the group. And so here's an example of. Of just of the results uh, that have been that have been coming, and and while it's got a fairly low at this particular when the screenshot was taken, it was a fairly low participation so far. Um, but um, but there's a, this is what I was saying a little earlier about the points um, that are showing up. So there's some equal equal running on here, um, but this isn't the poll which had that uh, polarizing major, uh, minority. Um, but yeah, so it just gives you a little bit of information now to, to see and to dig into this. So, you know, your, your questions here would be, um, you know, you may just take the top three and say, well, okay, let's focus on these three. Um, but uh, this one ranks pretty highly. These two rank pretty highly as well. Should we be doing something about these two groups? They got a lot of votes. You know, what should we be doing about this? So what you're doing with these polls is uncovering information. Um, from the network of, uh, of what you're looking to, do, to look at further. Um, actually, this is the uh, proposal itself. So then uh, just so clicking on that, it's just taking me straight through into the, um, uh, to the outcome of that. Uh, thanks for the votes and comments. Um, based on the results, there are enough people to set up three to four communities of practice. I'll post up more details once we have set them up. In the meantime, uh, myself and Rachel will be in contact. Um, deciding together. Uh, another um, quick example around um, uh, governance is uh, creating a space for, for your board. Uh, typically, when you're bringing people together here, you're being clear about who and what the space is for, um, how decisions are going to be made. Uh, so we're going to make them on Lumio, but we're going to um, ratify them at board meetings, um, include them within formal meeting minutes. Um, and who has access to the group, what other sort of reference documents are there. So bringing them together, this, I'm sorry, this one's a little bit dense. Um, we're discussing the topic here. This is looking at a funding application for, um, for a person that's seeking some funds, uh, some comments and so forth that run, uh, run through here. And, and there's a timeline um, developing um, in the thread as well which is showing key events of what is happening through the thread. Uh, and that comes up to um, approving, uh, a request to approve uh, funding for the roadshow um, and, um, and a result you know, based on people's um, uh, responses. So just a couple of quick, quick, um, introductions really to examples of how, how Lumio you know, has been used in these different situations um, and a clear outcome. So you'll notice there's a couple of, of things here. There's a, you know, who started the proposal, when it started, um, what the name of it was or the question that was being responded, uh, when it was closed, this one was closed a wee while ago, um, the outcome of this and uh, you know who who wrote the outcome. So it's giving a clear a clear outcome of that decision. Now there's just um, just in the last couple of minutes, um, I wanted to come back to that question of Catherine's of uh, of hosting, um, otherwise known as facilitation. And and in the digital world, um, there is a need to be a little bit more. Uh, intentional about uh, the way that you are hosting a conversation. Um, but I've just given you a snapshot of, of a, a number of different things I've thrown at you about how that, how that might work, which are almost like different pieces of the puzzle. 
what, um, what we've attempted to do in this slide is to show how you can actually use a thread to, uh, to facilitate towards an outcome. And you may be quite familiar, this is um, similar, to, similar to a theory U sort of um, process where there's an initiation, a sensing, a welcoming of diversity of, of a divergence, because we're looking for lots of ideas and for what people are thinking about. Um, progressing over time towards converging to some, uh, some conclusions. Uh, so beginning to narrow down some options, identify the most um, uh, popular options or the most preferable ones. And, and in a Lumio thread, uh, some of the tools that we would do is, is set up a new discussion. Um, we would, um, you can mention a person, uh, you know, in the tool. We can run a, a poll for which options uh, that you prefer. Uh, and then, in a simplistic way, move forwards to a proposal. Maybe we have a couple of iterations of that proposal um, towards finally publishing an outcome. So... I think uh, one of the uh, big part of the work that uh, we're doing right now, we're actually working to build templates um, into Lumio, is to look at the kind of common workflow processes and decision making processes that um, that one goes through, and helping to facilitate that process. So people know when they're starting out what journey they're going on, and you can feel confident as you're progressing through to um, towards an outcome. Um, That's great. I love that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Sue. Um, mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's we're helpful. just coming. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. just coming up to time. Um, I think I've got one or two more, and then I'll close. Oh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so some some more reading. Uh, there's a few links here to to some direct examples. Um, uh, one from a Canadian human resources company that uh, switched to a totally self-organizing um, model. Uh, so they, they, all of the middle managers gave up their positions and they went to a um, flat organization. Very interesting to read that. Um, Economic Democracy Advocates is a US-based group that uh, we're working to use Lumio to develop a charter. Um, I put in this uh, uh, Belgium car sharing cooperative. I thought you might that might be interesting for you to see uh, some of the ways that they've been using Lumio for engaging their members uh, and progressing their work. And, um, and this last one is um, actually a political party developing uh, using Lumio for policy where they've engaged, you know, the results here, 345 people. So just to show that this can work at scale. Um, you know, we've actually seen hundreds and hundreds of people engaged in, uh, in these kinds of um, uh, proposals. Um, and there's some more information here as well. One thing in particular I would encourage you to have a look at if you're interested in what we've just been talking about is the facilitator's guide. This is a detailed um, map uh, and, and description through good facilitation practices and how uh, you can use Lumio to apply that. Um, and my last sort of sign off uh, for this, uh, unless there are any further questions, um, is this how you can contact me. And, um, and if you click on that button, you can start a group for free. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you. This is really helpful to have a deeper dive. Um, I'm going to, you know, Dantes, Bruce, Andrew, any comments, questions? See how this could be useful. I just think that it's a really good process of being able to streamline decision making mm -hmm. um, and making sure that you're very inclusive. Um, as we stated earlier, that's a big problem with the pandemic <laughs> of kind mm -hmm. of forgetting people. Um, mm -hmm. So and you, you can kind of, as you say, you can see the progression of the project you're working on. Um, you don't have to start at the beginning to be able to follow um, what's ah, happening. Good point, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's a very big thing, um, especially when you work on multiple projects, kind of tend to have brain fog some, day, some days 
um, <laughs> left them off. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, this is this alleviates that that process of you know that hiccup of forgetting things um, mm. because it's all in a centralized location um, where you can put documents, poll questions. You can see who voted for what, um, and then just put them in the the group or subgroup that they would succeed in. Mm -hmm. I think this is very much um, something that help will help people succeed beyond what they think they can. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. Mm -hmm. Great. So we've, we've lost Andrew. Um, <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> Yeah, what, what I appreciated, even though like you know it, is the fact that with the asynchronous um, and that you're trying to get a decision, people, you know, like I'm dealing with people in different time zones, like we're all in different, our, as a team we are. Yeah. I was just on a call with somebody like that we work with quite a bit who's in London, right? So the idea of like you've set a time frame, you have a process and people need to respond like I know we don't have time but I am curious about um in response to what Catherine was saying that nudging mm -hmm. <laughs> piece because I think that's really interesting I like that like you don't all have to do it at the same time but you have to do it by a time if that yeah. makes sense right um I think that's really helpful so that was kind of like oh yeah that's that's great so so thank you I'm very, very grateful for your time. And um, this is amazing, like all of the resources that you provided today. So, so thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, keen to, keen to help you further. So any further questions that pop up, you know, we mm -hmm. actually have a Lumia group now that's, uh, that's live for, for this. So oh. uh, you, could, you could use it to ask some questions. Uh, we oh, can nice. post, okay. post the resources in there just to get familiar. And, uh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, Bruce, because uh, you asked some questions, you know, you answered some of the questions. So yeah, you could, um, yeah, we have, a, we have a little group. <laughs> So, That's right. Good. You can explore this further. So, um, so I think uh, so. What I would encourage you to do then, uh, Sue, is at the end of the call, once you've uh, done done the um, uh, got the recording and so forth uh, on YouTube, uh, post up a thread and embed mm -hmm. the um, okay. the YouTube video in the thread, and say mm -hmm. um, uh, and open a discussion for you know what what would you like to learn next or what to explore okay. next. Great. All right, Thank do your you. homework. That's right. I know. <laughs> Just got to figure all that one out. So anyway, yeah, yeah. very good. <laughs> good. Oh, okay. Good. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.